Uh, this is uh, no offense, but you are a robot, aren't you? That is correct, sir. For your convenience, I am monitored to respond to the name Robbie. Nice climate you have here. High oxygen content. I rarely use it myself, sir. It promotes rust. That's a clip from the landmark 1956 science fiction film Forbidden Planet. And this is The Hook. Hey everybody, I'm Andrew Roush, and I love the University of Texas so much that I would go out into the stars for UT, all the way out there in space. I mean, there are, there are UT astronauts, so I, I wouldn't be the first, and it wouldn't be that remarkable, but I would do it. Folks, if there's one thing I've learned in doing 59 episodes of this show, it's that people love a few certain things. They love robots for some reason I can't understand. Uh, they love fancy new technologies like 3D printing, and they love space. I mean, I get it. I went to the Johnson Space Center as a kid and took pictures next to the Saturn V rocket, and I had those little glow-in-the-dark plastic stars you'd stick up on your ceiling. You know what I'm talking about. You know you had them, too. So I was excited as anyone else when I heard about this. NASA's Kepler mission has discovered the first near-Earth-sized planet orbiting in the habitable zone of a star very similar to our sun. That's right, with the help of UT researchers and the UT McDonald Observatory, NASA's Kepler mission, which is out there searching for Earth-like planets, just may have found an Earth-like planet. It's about the size of Earth, it orbits a star like ours, and it orbits in the habitable zone of its solar system. But you don't have to take my word for it, because... Why would you? I'm not an exoplanetary expert like Michael Indel, who helped shepherd this discovery along. So, Dr. Indel, why don't you spare me the embarrassment and explain to our viewers what this habitable zone thing is all about? You have to put it at the right distance to its star so that you have liquid water on its surface. So, uh, if you put it too close, like Mercury, the water would just evaporate because it's too hot. If you go too far away, beyond Mars, it becomes too cold, the water would be a frozen surface. And the Earth is right in the, in the habitable zone of our solar system. We have a very nice ocean on our surface. And this is kind of the, the original classical idea, the Goldilocks zone, you're just right. It's not too hot and not too cold. And by being in this just right zone, scientists believe that these planets are more likely to have rocky surfaces and liquid water and, you know, the kinds of things that have led to the development of life on this planet. But don't pack your bags just yet, besides the fact that I'm counting on your vote next November, Roush 2016. Uh, Kepler 452b is like 1400 light years away, so maybe just make the most of what you got here. Anyway, this Goldilocks habitable zone thing makes sense, but don't you think it's a little conservative? I mean, I was on the internet the other day and I saw this video of this thing called a tardigrade and it's like this little nightmare micro creature. I don't know what its deal is, but they sent it out to space and it can exist in the vacuum of space. No water, no nothing. What do you say to that? We have discovered on our Earth uh, all these extremophiles, all these uh, microbes that thrive under extreme conditions. And you can put these um, life forms, for instance, on moons of Jupiter or Saturn and have them thrive and live there happily. And this, this is far outside the, the classic habitable zone. So that doesn't mean that life cannot be, and nature is probably far more creative in that respect than we can imagine at the moment. But uh, if you want to uh, design an experiment, then you start with the things you know. And we know that, yes, here, obviously, life has formed on this planet because it's in the habitable zone. Well, I was hoping to use that Jeff Goldblum, life finds a way clip again, but I guess you're right. Oh, you know what, Corey, just roll it anyway. Life uh, finds a way.
All right, Dr. Endel, and while I'm delighted by your Christoph Waltz-like accent, nobody gets off this show without inspiring me. So what's the big takeaway from this discovery? How are we uh, uh, pushing the limits of human knowledge and the, the boundaries of human endeavor and exploring the universe and learning more and going boldly where no one has gone before? It was an, an incredible important first step. And yeah, we will learn about basically how do we design our next experiment? What's the next step? Uh, maybe how big does a mirror have to be in space to resolve planets around at least 20 stars in the solar neighborhood? Something like this. It's very, very important. I would say Kepler, the Kepler mission is, is a true revolution in exoplanet science. Now, I'm not trying to offer everyone who comes on this show a position in a potential Andrew Rausch presidential administration, but I'm willing to bet that there's a pretty cushy NASA job in it for you if I do win. If you want to learn more about the discovery of Kepler-452b, or as I'm calling it, Planet Rausch, uh, check out the link in the description down below, and it's also paired up with three UT news stories you should check out. Uh, you can find out what UT's latest $3.5 million grant is for. You can find out who the greatest two-sport athletes in UT history are, and you can find out what one UT researcher has to say about the importance of federal funding for basic research. As always, uh, keep up with the latest by subscribing to The Hook and to this YouTube channel, and by following the Texas X's in our magazine, The All Call Day, on all your favorite social media outlets, all the tweets and the Facebooks and the grams and all that good stuff. And uh, one more note before I go, I'm about to hit that long and winding campaign trail, and I just wanted to take a moment to thank you, my fellow Longhorns, for your support, both in the show and then in the election, because I'm sure you're gonna vote for me and donate lots of money and form super PACs, right guys? Right. Well, anyway, uh, The Hook will be on hiatus for a while, but until then, you've got uh, plenty of time to catch up on episodes you missed or go back and rewatch your favorites. So please do so. And until the next time we meet, I'm Andrew Rausch. Stay hooked.